text this morning is going to be from 1 Corinthians chapter 6, starting in verse number 1. It says, when one of you has a grievance against another, does he dare go to law before the unrighteous instead of the saints? Or do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world is to be judged by you, are you incompetent to try trivial cases? Do you not know that we are to judge angels? How much more, then, matters pertaining to this life? So if you have such cases, why do you lay them before those who have no standing in the church? I say this to your shame. Can it be that there is no one among you wise enough to settle a dispute between the believers? I got to have lunch this week with an old friend. Um, we've been friends for 30 years, more than 30 years, and we were talking about uh, some of the things that happened in our childhood. And, you know, when you've been friends with anyone for 30 years, you've had the ups and the downs, the good times and the bads. I, I would say that we were, um, we were good enough friends that we've laughed together and we've cried together and such good friends that we've almost died together as well. You know those friends that you've had forever. Uh, we were talking about one time in particular. Uh, we were kids. We both attended this church together. And back in the day, y'all, if you wanted to be a member of what was Emmanuel Baptist Church then, um, it was mandatory for membership that you went to Mazio's for pizza after church on Sunday. And so our families were there. It wasn't really mandatory. It's just what you did, you know. Uh, peer pressure, everyone went. And we were at Mazio's, and our parents did what parents do. And they spent way too much time talking and visiting. And so we would uh, hang out near, they had the video games over there. And uh, my friend uh, was standing on a chair. We were young enough, standing on a chair, and he was playing his video game. And, I, you know, I'm just a, a punk kid, and so what do I do? I'm going to harass my friend. He apparently had quarters to play, and I didn't. And so I would walk by and bump the chair while he was playing, and he would almost fall off. And, of course, I thought that was hilarious. And so I'd done it several times throughout the, the day we'd been there. And then finally one time, I, I was actually headed to the bathroom, and I didn't intend to bump his chair, but it was kind of packed tightly. There were lots of people around, and I did. I bumped his chair, and this time worse than the others, and he nearly fell, and he turned, and he poured his entire Coke all over me, like poured it down. I'm soaking wet with you know, sticky, sugary soda all over me. And you know, the funny thing about that was that as a kid, I mean, that was a pretty, it, it wasn't a really kind thing to do, obviously. It's kind of a big deal that in the middle of a restaurant, you just dumped the soda all over my head. And, and I was thinking, if he did that to me today, like, that would be an issue, you know, for a much longer time than it was back then. But as, as young boys, and we just kind of ignored it, right? We, we just worked through it without much trouble. Uh, we went on with our friendship. It was like a tiny bump in the road. And, and we get to be friends uh, 30 years later. And I'll, I'll be honest, if, if we're just kind of laying out the score, uh, he was gracious to me way more than I was ever gracious to him. But we get to enjoy a, a friendship that's lasted more than 30 years now uh, because of all of those times when we were willing to overlook an offense or work through the difficulties, the struggles that have come. And like I said, there have been many over the course of 30 years. I, I tell you that story because in the, the life of every individual who has a relationship with anybody, there will be conflict. We're going to have struggles. People are going to disappoint us. They're going to frustrate us. Y'all, I'm really impatient, and, and I get irritated, right? there. When we have relationships, there's going to be conflict. There's going to be friction. And so today, I want to talk to us about how the church should address conflict, how we should handle it. Now, the interesting thing in the text that we're going to see today is the Apostle Paul, who prior was a Hebrew of Hebrews and a Pharisee of Pharisees. He wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. He was an apostle who was called by Jesus Christ himself, and yet the Apostle Paul is not surprised at all when there is conflict in the church. Now, oftentimes there is this view among church people is that we, sh we should all be perfect, right? If I go to church, I should never have a problem with anybody. It's the church, right? It should be perfectly smooth sailing, never any conflict anywhere. And yet, that certainly wasn't the view 
of the Apostle Paul. What he understood and what we should understand as believers in Jesus Christ who are not yet made perfect is we will have conflict with our brothers and our sisters in the church, with our friends, with those in our small group. Man, if you go to church with your family, it's coming, you know. And so the the question I want to answer today is how should believers handle conflict? in the church when it happens between us. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Now, to give you a little bit more of the context here, what the Apostle Paul is speaking about are civil disagreements that happened in the church. So apparently, I don't know if it was a failed business partnership, I don't know if someone didn't keep their end of a deal, or maybe someone had damaged the property of another. We're not told what the specific circumstances were that caused the Apostle Paul to write to the church at Corinth, but he's addressing some sort of civil dispute between two people in the church. And this may have been played out multiple times over. Again, if he included it in his letter, it was obviously an issue in the church. And so here's what he says to them. He says, when one of you has a grievance against another, does he dare go to law before the unrighteous instead of the saints? So the grievance here, just to be really clear on the front end, this is not a criminal sort of of offense. Um, On the front end of the sermon here, if someone is committing a crime against you, harming you in some way, please call the police, right? We want to deal with that in criminal courts, but that's not the case. That's not what the Apostle Paul is addressing here. When he uses the term grievance, he's talking about some sort of civil uh, dispute or disagreement. Does he dare? Do you dare take your brother to a Roman court to settle a dispute between you? And that word dare, do you dare, is an intentionally strong word. Uh, This is not a letter where the Apostle Paul is sugarcoating things for the Corinthian believers. They were making some pretty big mistakes, and the Apostle Paul, who loved them deeply and wanted to see them live out the abundant life in Christ Jesus, he's writing very firmly to correct some of these behaviors. And so there's a disagreement that existed. And what did the Corinthians do? They did what they'd always known to do. They did what everyone in their culture said was the right thing to do. They were taking each other to court. They were suing one another. Now, Paul's going to bring up two problems with that sort of behavior. Um, The first problem is that the the Roman courts were, were notoriously corrupt. Okay, There was no equal justice under the law in the Roman society. Although they did aim for that, it just never actually happened for them. Um, rather than administering justice, uh, judges in the courts, other people in the court system were often open to receiving bribes. As a matter of fact, in Roman courts, they observed the principle of dignitas, which says you should show favoritism to the person who has greater wealth, or power, or even something so simple as style. So you, you show up dressed like a million bucks, they're going to treat you uh, like a million bucks. And so what would happen are people, were the people of power in Roman society, and it happened in the church too. If you enjoyed greater wealth or status, and you had nicer things, you could show up and crush your brother in court, even if you were the one in the wrong. And so the Apostle Paul, in writing to the church, he's saying, hey, I know how it plays out in culture, but that's not our normal. When you belong to the body of Jesus Christ, why would you dare entrust yourself to a court that you know is corrupt? And why would you go and try to win a a disagreement or a dispute with your brother, a judgment against them before a court that you know to be corrupt? And so, number one reason the Apostle Paul is again, not shocked that there's conflict, but he's shocked at the way that they're handling it. He's shocked that they would take one another to court because the courts were obviously corrupt. But there's another part to that. The Apostle Paul is also shocked that the believers at Corinth would entrust themselves to an unjust court, but they wouldn't entrust themselves to the church of Jesus Christ. And when you think about who the church is, 
we are a people. If you're a, a member of, of, of the body of Jesus Christ, you have been saved by his grace. You, like every other believer, are someone who found yourself owing an extraordinary debt of sin before God. We are a people who, if we were brought to court, would have been declared guilty of sin every single time. And yet, in our relationship with Jesus... We see that the innocent man laid down his life for the guilty. The person who was 100% right died for those who were utterly wrong. He offered himself to endure the punishment that we deserved. And so here we are, people who have come to faith in Jesus Christ, who have had enormous debts forgiven. Our Savior shed his blood for us. He endured the cross for us. And as a people who are following in the example of Jesus, that's what we're supposed to do for one another. If you can't find justice in the church, where are you going to find it? And so he's scolding them a bit. How dare you take each other to court, unjust courts, rather than entrusting yourself to the church. Now, um, if you are a modern American Christian, the idea of entrusting yourself to your church, it probably feels a little bit foreign. To be honest with you, this is one of those sections of Scripture that for whatever reason, uh, the American church has largely chosen to ignore. But when we have disputes with one another, when we have followed Matthew chapter 18, 15 through 17, we talked about it last week, where if your brother sins against you or you have an issue with your brother, you're supposed to go to him on your own, right? You go and have the conversation. You're seeking to be reconciled, right? You go alone first. If he doesn't repent, if you can't be reconciled at that opportunity, you bring other people into the mix. You broaden the circle a bit. And you invite other people in the church to speak into that. If still he doesn't repent, you can't be reconciled. Ultimately, you would bring the issue before the entire church. You would involve more and more and more people. And the hope every single time is that we could be reconciled with our brother or sister who has sinned against us. Now, in my experience growing up, and I grew up in this church, I've never seen this play out. You know what? People who call themselves Christians, who say they believe the Bible, you know what we normally do? We do what our culture tells us we're supposed to. If we don't take each other to a civil court, we might try the case in the court of public opinion, right? You blast somebody on Facebook, or maybe it's not social media, but you do it among your circle of friends. Look at how they wrong me. You paint the picture from one side so they only see one part of the story. And maybe you're totally right. As believers in Jesus Christ, the Apostle Paul, God speaking through the Apostle Paul, gave us instructions for how we should handle disagreements with our brothers when they sin against us or when there's some sort of civil dispute. And rather than going out and blasting it, you know, court of public opinion, whatever that might look like, or taking them to some court of civil court that exists in our society, we should bring that before the church and entrust ourselves to the judgment of our brothers and sisters in Christ. Here's what the Apostle Paul says in verse 2. He says, Or do you not know that the saints will judge the world? Now, in, in saying this, the Apostle Paul is speaking... Big, ugly, nerdy word. Eschatologically, he's talking about in the end times, the last days, uh, when Jesus returns and he gathers all of his people to himself, in some way you and I will participate with Christ in judging the whole world. And the case that Paul is making, he's like, hey, that's a pretty big deal. I mean, that's, that's a really substantial thing. And if... We are competent enough to judge the world. Shouldn't we be able to judge in trivial matters? Shouldn't we be able to handle that? He goes on. He says in verse uh, 3, Do you not know that we are to judge angels? Apparently, 
at the end times? I, I don't know. I can't give you an extensive uh, discussion of this concept in a different part of the Bible. But apparently in the end of times, uh, the fallen angels who have sinned against God in some way that we will participate in judging them as well. Do you, do you not know that we are to judge angels? How much more then matters pertaining to this life? So if you have such cases, why do you lay them before those who have no standing in the church? I say this to your shame. Apostle Paul's like, man, this is tragic that the people of God who often parade around with their Bibles telling the world that they have the source of truth, that they know the way and the truth and the life. They know what righteousness is. They know what evil is. It's funny, they can't seem to figure it out when it comes to disputes between them because they rush off to criminal court or civil courts just like the rest of the world rather than entrusting themselves to one another And they go blast each other on social media just like everybody else. The Apostle Paul says, this is to our shame. Church, in the midst of every single conflict, we have the opportunity to demonstrate the gospel to the world. We have the opportunity to demonstrate that we really believe what the Word of God says. And we're willing to live that out in our lives. Jesus gave a parable in Matthew chapter 7. And he says, the man who hears these words of mine, and he puts them into practice, right? Hears and then does what it says. He's like the man who built his house on the rock. The rains fell and the winds blew and the storm raged. And that house stood strong. But the man or the woman who hears these words of mine but doesn't actually live them out. It's like the person that built their house on the sand. Things look good, but then the rain began to fall, and the wind began to blow, and the storm began to rage, and that house fell with a great crash. Church, the world is looking to us to see whether or not we truly believe what the Word of God says. And it is to our shame if we don't walk in obedience to what the Scriptures would say. Oftentimes in the American church today, we have a severely deflated view of how important the church should be in our lives. We have an anemic view of what it looks like to submit ourselves one to another, to belong to the body of Christ, of the role that the church should play in our lives. And I believe that we as the people of God need to recapture that and live, not just hearing and reading what the Word of God has to say, but living it out in our lives. Now, he's going to say something to the people at Corinth that probably stung a little bit. If you've been with us throughout this series, uh, you know that the people at Corinth, they were really interested in wisdom, right? Man, they were like comparing which person they followed, like who was more wise, who had more persuasive words, who was the better orator and speaker, So the Apostle Paul asked him some questions. Can it be that there is no one among you wise enough to settle a dispute? Those of you who are obsessed with wisdom, who spend all of your time in the marketplace, in the agora, listening to all of these wonderful and wise ideas, is there nobody wise enough to settle a dispute between the brothers? But brother goes to law against brother, and that before unbelievers. He's pointing out what would often happen in these Roman courts. They were were held in in a a marketplace. It was a a bima court. And the people would gather around. And in the bima courts, uh, young orators would come and they would serve as advocates or kind of like our attorneys. And what was customary in the Roman courts uh, were for their attorneys or these advocates to use unbridled language toward their opponents. Um, These young orators would sharpen their rhetorical skills, resorting to colorful character assassination of their opponents. A believer was taking his fellow believer to court and unleashing his advocate 
on his brother, but also his opponent. And unbelievers would sit, and they would watch as one attorney tore the opponent apart. And then they would trade sides, and back and forth, slander, maligning the character of a brother. And the Apostle Paul, once again, to your shame, this is how you're doing things? And once again, I think there's a parallel to how the people of God often speak to one another when we have disagreements on social media. And sometimes we just kind of start. Y'all ever do that? You kind of just start the disagreement, then you back your way out, find your chair, and you just sit back while in the comments. People just, they say everything you wanted to say, but you still kind of get to stay out of it. You know what I'm saying? And they tear each other up. Or maybe you start it in your workplace or at your school. And you sit idly by while people who took your side devour another person with their words. And the Apostle Paul, this is to our shame. This isn't our normal. This is how the people of God act. And he asks some questions here that are really, really important as we think about how should we handle conflict in the church. Number one, how do we handle conflict in the church? Number one, we take it to the church rather than the courts. If there is a dispute, I would recommend that you go to your small group. Well, first of all, you go to your brother. You try to work things out on your own. If a dispute continues between you and another person, and it's ongoing, if you can't just overlook the offense, right, if it's an ongoing struggle in your heart, uh, then you should go to your small group and be like, hey, can you meet with their small group? Let's get together. We need to talk about this thing. And I'm going to submit myself to your judgment. I'm not going to be arrogant over the long term. And if someone disagrees with me, I'm going to run off to another church and say just how bad all those people are. But in my group of people that I trust and that I love, I'm willing to submit myself to their judgments to, of the, the people of God. Once again, I'm going to submit myself to their judgments. And if they're not asking me to do something that's clearly unbiblical, then I'm going to submit to what they have to say. And I'm going to work through this thing. And then if that continues to not work, you might involve church leadership. But at the end of the day, what the Apostle Paul calls us to do is to entrust ourselves to one another. This is a quick question. When was the last time you asked your small group to speak into your life, to help you work through a decision or a conflict or a dispute? And when was the last time they told you something that you didn't agree with? But you're like, you know what? I know that you're men and women of God. And I know that you're pointing me to the Word. And so I'm going to submit myself to that. I hear you. And I think you're right. Do you know what we subscribe to as believers in the church? Do you know what really drives most of our practice as the body? Rugged American individualism. And if the idea of inviting someone else to speak into your life and you being willing to submit to them causes you to bristle, it may be because you have submitted yourself more to the principle of rugged American individualism than you have the Word of God. The Apostle Paul is very explicit here. When we're in the midst of conflict with other believers, we should take it to the church rather than to the courts. We should submit ourselves one to another. But that's not all. Because I'll be honest with you, every dispute isn't settled because you're willing to take it to the church. It doesn't always fix it. Sometimes people sin against us. They damage our property. They do things that they have no ability to repay. And sometimes when they do, they're still unwilling to do so. And so the Apostle Paul asks a question that's important, and it reveals our hearts. It might bring some of our idols to the surface. Here's what he says. Verse 7, he says, To have lawsuits at all with one another is already a defeat for you. When you go to court, nobody wins. Not you, not your opponent, not unbelievers who watch how you follow the process. And then he asks questions. Why not rather suffer wrong? Why not rather be defrauded? But you yourselves wrong and defraud even your own brothers. 
Now, when I read those questions on the surface, why not rather suffer wrong? Why not rather be defrauded? Um, I think, well, of course. Like, who wants to suffer wrong? Who wants to be defrauded? Like, why in the world would any of us ever want that? And in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 19 and 21, the Apostle Peter speaks to us about the life of a disciple and the things that we should anticipate and welcome into our lives. Here's what he says. He says, For this is a gracious thing when mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering justly. For what credit is it if when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure, right? If, if you deserve punishment and you endure punishment, that you got what you deserve. There, like, there's no credit there. But for the life of a believer, if when you do good, if when you tried to hold on to your integrity, and you were patient and gracious and long-suffering, and the person still didn't come around, and they still didn't give you what they owed you, when you still didn't get back what you deserved, if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. Jesus Christ saw us in our sin. And he came to this world and lived a perfect, sinless life. That he might go to the cross to suffer the punishment that you and I deserved. And in the agony of the cross, Jesus wasn't fighting for his rights. In taking on human flesh, he wasn't fighting for the glory that he deserved. In suffering, the nails through his wrist and his ankles, the beatings and the abuse, the mocking, men spitting in his face, and the crown of thorns on his head. Jesus wasn't fighting to make sure that he was repaid fully. He was sacrificially laying down his life for us. And the invitation to every single Christian is to come and follow me. The life of Jesus Christ is an example of how we are to willingly suffer on behalf of other people. Church, this is to what we have been called. Now, I know we live in a fairly just society. We have some wonderful attorneys. We have a judge in our church, and I'm thankful for the role that they play. But in many cases, they should be completely irrelevant to us because we shouldn't consider it a joy to suffer for others as Jesus Christ has suffered for us. To endure for the sake of our brother. If we take them to court, we fight for our rights, we get what we deserve, we claim what we're owed, everybody loses. But when we're willing to submit ourselves and to even willingly endure suffering on behalf of our brother, everybody can win. And the world has a testimony of what it looks like to follow Jesus. The world has a testimony that our Savior Jesus Christ is a Savior who didn't count our sins against us, a Savior who didn't fight for what was His, but rather laid down His life in love for the world around Him, and you and I should do the same. We proclaim the gospel by doing that. Look, look what he says here in verse 9. Is he just reminds them of who they are now in Christ. He says, or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers, none of those people will inherit the kingdom of God. 
And if you're sitting here today and you're like, well, I just checked off seven out of ten boxes. Like, I'm, I'm in trouble. I won't inherit the kingdom of God. Um, keep, keep listening. Because the Apostle Paul is reminding all of these Corinthian believers of who they used to be. And if you could do a poll in this church as well, if you want to know who Cross Community is, the, the members that make up this body, man, if you were to just run down this list, everyone in this room is going to have to raise their hand and be like, guilty. Guilty. Over and over and over, the people who comprise this body, the same as the church at Corinth, we would have to raise our hand and say, I'm guilty. I have sinned. What I do not deserve is the kingdom of God. But then there's one of those beautiful phrases in the Bible. And especially if you're here today and you're not a believer in Jesus Christ, we want you to hear this phrase. We want to hear uh, the, the reason why we praise God and we thank Him for the cross. Here is where it is. In verse 11. He's run through this list of all of these wretched sins in the sight of God. And he says, and such were some of you. And then one of those big buts in Scripture. But you were washed. We were filthy in our sin. We were covered in guilt and shame. But we were washed. You were sanctified. That, that word means to be made holy or to be made a saint. But you were justified. That's a legal term that means to be declared not guilty. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. The Apostle Paul is just reminding them of who we are in Christ Jesus. We are those who owed a debt that we couldn't pay, and Jesus Christ paid it on our behalf. He was reminding them of the great exchange where Jesus took all of our sin and credited to us all of his righteousness. That's who we are as believers, and that's how we should live in this world. Oh, you got a dispute with your brother? Take it to the church, and if that doesn't settle it, number two, rather suffer wrong than continue in disunity with your brother or your sister. Man, that, it glorifies God. It honors Him. It pleases Him. It is a gracious thing in His sight. So, once again, how do we handle conflict? Take it to the church rather than the courts, and we prefer personal loss over mutual defeat. Now, what does it look like for us to walk in obedience to this? Today is Mother's Day. Many of us have been loved really, really well by a mother who demonstrated just this. Um, it doesn't just have to be the big things when someone has, you know, a big civil case against you or you against them. It can also be in the small things where we as the people of God, we offer ourselves, we lay down our lives in service to our friend, our brother, or our sister in Christ. For many of us, that's been the experience, what we experience with our mom who day in and day out, not always in the biggest of ways, right? Not in million-dollar judgments, but sometimes in the tiniest and unseen ways. Our moms have served us and have cared for us. They'd rather suffer loss than get what they're due. And as the church of Jesus Christ, that's how we are to live. So what does it look like for us to respond in obedience to this text? Number one, um, maybe you're here and you don't know Jesus Christ. You've never experienced being washed. You've never been made holy by the blood of Jesus. You've never been declared not guilty before God. What I want you to know is that God loves you. And he died that you might find a new life in him where he transforms your heart and makes you a new creation in him. And so, number one, you can respond in faith in Jesus Christ today, believing he's the son of God who died on the cross for your sins and receiving the benefits of the death of Jesus Christ on your behalf, being washed and sanctified and justified by Him. Number two, you can respond in gratitude for God's grace and mercy that have been demonstrated in your own life. We're going to sing in just a second, and you can worship God with your lips, praising Him for saving a person like you who didn't deserve it, for being willing to suffer loss on your behalf. And the final thing here is responding in obedience to God's word. 
And maybe for you, today's the day that you need to pick up the phone and have the first conversation. You know that you have disunity with a brother. You've been divided. There's a broken relationship, and you need to take step one and make the phone call and be like, hey, we need to work some things out. Or maybe today you need to involve your community group. Would you speak into this in my life? Would you help me sort this out? Maybe for you, you've been sitting there pondering a civil case against someone. You need to bring it to the church. Or maybe you need to say, you know what? Jesus Christ endured an unjust penalty on my behalf, and I'm going to do the same for somebody else. Whatever it looks like, I want to invite you to respond in Jesus Christ to obedience. We're going to have a time of invitation before we do. Would you pray with me? Father, we do thank you for your word and that you have given us the example to follow. That you don't leave us alone here in this life to figure it out for ourselves, but you have led us and you've given us the path of abundance in our lives. And so, Lord, we just pray that through the power of your Spirit that we may see believer reconciled to believer. And God, that we might be a model for the world of what it looks like to lay down our lives in sacrificial love for one another. Father, may we be faithful to you. For the person who's here that doesn't know you, I pray that today might be the day of salvation. And I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Right now, I'm going to invite you to, st to stand and just to respond in obedience to the word of Jesus Christ.